Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Gary Eck. Thank you. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, fantastic to be here at the Sydney Opera House. I've always wanted to work here, and uh, now, thanks to a global pandemic, I can. Uh, there's just one catch. There's no audience. There's no audience. There's no one here. And there's even a camera over here to remind you that there's no one here. Look at that. That's usually there reserved to make you look amazing. So when they cut to this camera, there's a full audience just laughing and cheering, and that's there right now to show that, uh, well, there's no one, but that's okay. Uh, this is my COVID safe show, and I want you to know that all my jokes are two meters apart, okay? <laughs> so you're very safe here. So that's one, I'll just go over here now, do the second one. It's so weird, I'm just looking out at no one, it's so bizarre, it's in, but I've got three staff members that uh, have very gratefully sat down the front. Only problem is they've seen my act before. Um, <laughs> Oh, except for you, you just laughed. I did hear a laughter, I heard laughter, now I'm just gravitating towards you. This whole show, which this room holds like 1,500 people, and now it's dedicated just to you. This show is for you, there's one person down the front. I don't know, do you work here? You do? Okay, well that, that's, oh, that's good, just in case you wandered in off the street, going, this guy's not very popular. <laughs> he hasn't pulled anyone. The, the irony is, right, if I actually had booked this show for myself, like, you know, if this was a real show, this is how many people would probably turn up to my show. I'd come out and I'd go, how, how's it looking tonight? They'd go, ooh, it's a bit quiet, Kaz. <laughs> I think it's going to be a tough one. I don't mind performing to, to, to less people, to be honest. I actually did a show, like, you know, pre-pandemic, as they say, before, before pandemic. I, uh, at the Harold Park Hotel, right, I did a show there, to two people, <laughs> to two people, right? And get this, after the show, I actually gave the audience a lift home. <laughs> I'm not joking, I swear, I gave them a lift home. They were just sitting down the front, I'm just chatting to them, what else am I gonna do, right? You know, g'day, where do you live? And they said, oh, Leichhardt. I said, oh, I live in Haberfield. Do you want a lift, right? And they look at me and they go, yeah, that'd be great. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Wow, I've never been to a show and had a lift before. Oh, this works out really well. Ask him if he's going to Cairns on the weekend. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll drive you there as well. But I thought, you know what, I'm gonna honor it, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna drive them home because it's not often you get to drive the audience home. <laughs> like Seinfeld can't boast of driving the entire crowd home, right? I could and I did. Right? And then get this, as I'm driving them home, they started bagging the show. <laughs> They're going, oh, there weren't many people. Oh, shut up. I'm giving you a lift, it doesn't get any better than this. I didn't hear their response uh, because they're in the boot. <laughs> they're still there, it's COVID safe, you know, I didn't want to take them out in case they had something. But you know what, I can actually beat that. I mean, two people's pretty small. I mean, there are three people tonight, <laughs> which really rubs it in, because this is like a 1500 seater. At least at the Harold Park, two people in a little room, you kind of get away with it, but now I've got three. But I did a show and this is a record to no one. <laughs> I'm not even making this one up. I did a show, they started this room at uh, Bondi, it was a few years ago, and uh, I turn up, it's an 8.30 show, and I get there at eight and there's no one there. And I was like, oh, okay, it's a bit quiet. 8.30 comes along, no one, no one's turned up, right? 8.45, nine, no one, empty. And you can't help but take it personally. <laughs> like no one has turned up. And I say to the guy who's running the joint, I said, oh, wow, what do you want to do? I think he's just going to go, oh, you know, here's your, you know, your money, get out of here. But he goes, oh, no, just get up. <laughs> yeah, but there's no one here. Yeah, I know. They will come. <laughs> and he honestly said it like that. He said it like a prophet. Like he said it like he knew something else, like some, there was going to be some sort of divine intervention. You know, people at home going, I sense comedy. We need to help Gary immediately. Quickly, gather a crowd. So I think, oh, well, fair enough. I get up on stage, and sure enough, no one came. It's just me and chairs, empty chairs. Like now, I'm having a flashback. Ah! Ah! And I'm just talking, oh, you know, what do you do? And I'm thinking, oh, how long is this going to last? There's no one here. I'm thinking, I'll just do my 20 minutes, and then I can get the hell out, right? 20 minutes arrives, I think, oh, I just get off, and I, I walk up to the guy, and I say, oh, you know, can you believe that? And I swear to God, he goes, yeah, tough crowd. <laughs> there was no crowd. 
Ah, what else? I should uh, tell you more about myself. I know you're curious, probably wondering who I am, uh, what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm from Canberra originally. Right? Right? No, I, I, I grew up there, but not intentionally. Uh, my parents got stuck in a roundabout, <laughs> and they're still there going around in circles. I visit them, I visit them every Christmas. Mom, I love you. Where are you going? Ah! My name is Gary. Are there any, uh, normally I say are there any Garys in the audience, <laughs> but I've got a good chance there isn't, because I all know your names. Uh, is the camera, anyone calls this guy a camera? You, you, this guy, I don't know, are you, are you actually filming or are you just, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Everyone's been told they laugh. You can't laugh, you know, so. Because I, I, I want that cameraman who does that with the camera. Can you do that where it just jiggles because you're laughing so much? Oh, it doesn't do that. Oh, now he's coming on stage. It's like a Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> Exterminate, tell something funny, be funny now. That's right, no, you'd be great. You should actually come in right, right, right here. That would be brilliant. I would love to see a show where the cameraman just creeps up on the performer and they have no idea and I look around and you're right there. <laughs> just to really piss us off. No, but uh, my name is Gary. There are no Garys anymore. No one has named their child Gary since 1991. Don't laugh. That's not funny, all right? I didn't want the laugh at that. That's, that's terrible. No one's called Gary anymore. The only time you hear Gary is on TV when some idiot's trying to give up smoking, right? No one else has called Gary other than that. No one's called their, Gary, their child Gary since 1991. It's so sad. And no one ever comes up to me and says, Oh, Gary. Oh, that's a lovely name. Oh, that's gorgeous. Where is that from? Now everyone just names their kids after nouns. Blade, flint, rock, leaf, sky, river, pebble, <laughs> raindrop. And the one I hear now drives me crazy. Hunter. <laughs> How many hunters are there now? It's like hundreds of hunters everywhere, tribes of them. And the mums, oh, they love calling that name out. You see them at the park, they're like, Hunter! <laughs> Hunter, darling! That's right, his name's Hunter. <laughs> We're going now, Hunter. Come along, Hunter! <laughs> and then Hunter comes running. <laughs> I just booed myself. I mean, seriously, if you're going to call your kid Hunter, he better come running with a spear in one hand, dragging a dead caribou in the other. <laughs> yes, mother, what is it? I've got gazelle to slaughter, for I am a hunter mother, as you named me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you meet people who, like, change their names. You know, people have, like, middle crisis. I always find that kind of weird. I was doing this show and there was this woman sitting down the f and uh, I said, look, you know, you know, she was from the eastern suburbs or something, I can't remember. You know that area where people buy like, they don't buy free range eggs, they buy free roaming eggs that have been on yoga retreats. You know, the hens get daily massages and pep talks. Go on, release the chicken within, you can do it, go. You're such a good chicken, go, 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 go. When you buy the, when you buy the hens, they, they just put them in the fridge. In the, burp, there you go, scramble that, it's organic. <laughs> anyway, I'm talking to this woman, I said, oh, what's your name? And she says, it's Karan. <laughs> I said, Karan? How do you spell that? And she spells it, Karen. And I said, oh, that's, that's Karen, isn't it? She goes, I know, I know, but I pronounce it Karan. <laughs> and I said, what has as in wa anchor. <laughs> like my name's Gary, I don't go around calling myself Garari. My good name is Garari with 27 E's, the second E is silent, the third has an umlaut, and the Y is pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to call myself that so, you know, when I go into Starbucks and they have to call out my name, just to really annoy them, because they'll be there like, oh, what? How do, you, how do you pronounce this? It's got like 27 E's or something. 
I know, ask Ian, he should know. <laughs> yeah, Karen's brother, Karan's brother. And then, I, then you meet people who like don't question stupid names, right? This guy comes up to me after a show and he tells me a story. And it's a true story because he's in the story, right? He goes into Starbucks, orders a coffee. The girl says, what's your name? And he says, it's Mark with a C. So she writes, Kark. <laughs> like doesn't even question it, just very casually. C-A-R-K, there you go, Kark. <laughs> and then comes out with a coffee like a minute later. Cock, cock, cock. And Mark's not answering because his name is Mark, not cock. And then she's getting angry. Cock, 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 cock. Crows start circling. Oh, oh, cock. That's my name. Cock. I didn't order a coffee. I'm a bird. Cock. I'm actually thinking of joining the pretentious name club. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to change Gary because I'm proud of Gary. There are no Garys left, right? But what I'm going to do is do something no one has ever done before. I'm going to change my name by volume. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Yeah, from now on, you have to whisper my name. Yeah, try it. Say my name. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I had one person go, which, to be honest, is kind of creeping me out now that I think about it. At first I thought it'd be really cool, but now that's kind of weird. Just one person going, Gary. I don't want to go into Starbucks and they call out my name now. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be freakish. Gary. And then I'll take it, hey, my coffee's cold. Well, we called your name a thousand times, you didn't hear it. What else can I tell you about me? Uh, I'm married. Any, anyone married in, in this threesome? That sounded weird. <laughs> when there's three people in the audience, you are a threesome. All right, that is a threesome. I've been married 15 years, which is pretty cool these days. What do you reckon? Yeah? You don't care? I did a cruise ship once and, uh, oh wow, there was a really old, old audience and uh, I asked them, I said, oh, who, who's been married the longest? Just yell it out, right? And it started at 42 years. Right? That was the opening bid. And then it just kept rising. 45, 47, 49, 58, 63. <laughs> and then this woman stood up, bingo. And she won. That was the weird part. My, uh, my wife, she, uh, she speaks French, which is pretty amazing, and she's been speaking French to our kids since they were, you know, they were little. And my son, who's like 14 now, is, you know, practically fluent. Like, he walks around the house speaking French and reading French books and, you know, has like Friday French club with these friends. They all come over with berets and, you know, cheese and fake wine. <laughs> and I'm there, you know, trying to fit in. Uh, hey, son, uh, you want to go kick a footy? And he's like... No, Papa. <laughs> no, 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 no. I would rather discuss the existential meaning of the word football, Papa. <laughs> what does it mean to be a foot? What does it mean to be a ball? And why is it called football, Papa? When the ball is but connected to the foot for a fraction of a second? <laughs> Ask yourself that, Papa, why? Hmm. Why? Yeah, right, eh? Jeez, you can be a little dickhead sometimes, seriously. I'm going to ground you. And the problem is, right, I don't speak French. I don't speak a word of French. And now I'm worried my son's going to grow up and conspire against me in French, and I'm going to have no idea. You know, he'll be there. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Je ne sais pas quand j'ai les poissons. J'ai les poissons, j'ai les poissons, j'ai les poissons, j'ai les poissons, j'ai les poissons. Gary. Qu'est-ce qu'il ronge dans les poissons, j'ai les poison dada. Whoa, 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 what was that, son? Oh, nothing, 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 nothing. Go about your business. Nothing, nothing, nothing to see here, Faza. Actually, I'm sounding German now. <laughs> what have I done And my son smokes? This is terrible. What have I done? I actually do speak a bit of German uh, because I have a German shepherd. And, uh, yeah, his English is awful. It's so embarrassing. Like, he came home the other day and he's like, hello, 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 hello. How you going? 
I'm making that up, dogs don't talk, by the way. But people who have dogs think their dogs talk. I see them at the park having a conversation with their dog. It's so ridiculous. You're a good little boy. What do you want to do now, huh? You want to go for a walk? Maybe get something to eat? As if the dog's going to go, well, that sounds great, but right now I'm taking a dump, so a bit of privacy, thank you very much. I mean, it'd be great if my German Shepherd spoke German. I mean, how unreal would that be? Like, he could come home and he could tell me how his day was in German. I'd be like, g'day, boy, how's your day? What did you get up to, huh? He just looks at me. Yeah, yeah, ich bin ein football park. <laughs> und ein Auto chessen. Und ein Postman beiten. <laughs> und ein Dogbad schmellen. Und ein Groin und Gras rabben. <laughs> And, um, yeah, das ist alles, das ist alles, das ist alles, das ist alles, das ist alles. Are you sure that's all? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nein. Ich bin ein Labrador gebunken. <laughs> yeah, und ein Chihuahua. Das Chihuahua ist kaputt. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I do have to wrap it up. Uh, it's been unfortunate. Hey, but uh, I have to go. I want to stay. It's amazing. I was, I was actually dreading this, to be honest. And then I thought, wow, this has been amazing. I'm, this can actually be part of my, uh, my repertoire now. I've done two, I've done zero, two, and three uh, at the Opera House. Uh, but before I go, uh, does anyone need a lift? <laughs> yep, I, I can give you, <laughs> I can take three of you home. It's safe, all right. Uh, but thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in and watching at home. I'd now like to uh, introduce one of my personal favorites. Uh, this guy is absolutely amazing. He's Hales, originally from the US, but uh, he's been here for a little while. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Mr. Tommy Dean. Oh, that was exciting. Oh man, this is exciting. First off, let me just say uh, to all of you at home, when you wish, be clear. Because there was uh, one time recently I said to myself, you know what would be awesome? Doing a show at the Sydney Opera House. And then I, that's all I said. <laughs> so just maybe be more clear. I wish I could do a show at the Sydney Opera House with people there to watch. <laughs> that would have been a better wish. Now, you have to be careful. Like, imagine here in Australia, say you met the devil at the crossroads, and you went with, like, a classic teenage fantasy, and you're like, you know what I want, devil? I want to be in the biggest band ever. And the devil be all like, you're a wiggle. <laughs> no! 20 years, cold spaghetti, cold spaghetti. <laughs> Just quietly, no matter how much you sing about it, nobody likes cold spaghetti. Just so we're clear. <laughs> no kid will be tricked with a happy song and primary colors. I'm sorry, cold spaghetti sucks. I know that, because I have three kids, and I cook for them occasionally, and uh, the one thing they don't like, cold spaghetti. The second thing they don't like, uncooked spaghetti. No, it's crunchy. It's avant-garde. <laughs> Daddy's experimenting with fusion food. It's what Daddy does. He wants to be on Master Chef. Uh, it's exciting. Exciting in these unprecedented times. Uh, unprecedented. No times like this ever, except for the other times that were somewhat like this, but different. <laughs> and therefore not a precedent, and thus we are unprecedented. Uh, it has changed the flow of life. Here's a couple of small details that I never knew. Because we now wear masks when out in public for our own and others' safety, I never knew that I had lived my life up until this moment with eyeballs that are very cold. <laughs> Until I started steam heating them from under my mask, it had never occurred to me how cold my eyes are. <laughs> but now, thanks to mask technology, my eyes are always balmy and somewhat moist. <laughs> I feel like I'm halfway through a rom-com. I haven't quite understood what her motivation is, but I know they're gonna fall in love. <laughs> and when it happens, I will cry. 
I also wear glasses, as you can see, because I'm wearing them. Uh, just so you know, I realize that I may have gone into the women's section of the glass shop. I appreciate that. A lot of people like to point out that my glasses look like a woman's glasses, but I would like to point out that at the time that I was buying glasses, I didn't have glasses <laughs> because I had only just worked out that I need glasses. So I picked some glasses, and then once I had them home and on, I realized, okay, I see <laughs> what you're getting at. But these were quite expensive. So until I sit on them or lose them, these are the glasses I wear. <laughs> they don't have anti-fog technology. That's another part of the mask fun. And at first, that was annoying. But not only are my eyes balmy on a tropical holiday, but I can't see. Shuts out the ugliness of life. <laughs> and it makes shopping for vegetable and fruit exciting. You're never quite sure what you're going to get. Remember when you used to go to the shop and pick out exactly what you went to get? How boring, no surprises. But when your glasses fog up, it felt like a tangerine. But it turns out it was a wilted lemon. And when life gives you wilted lemons, you go back to the shop. It's harder now, shopping is uh, much harder now. It's, it's harder. It's harder because I don't know if I'm allowed to touch apples to see if they're ripe. <laughs> Are you allowed to touch an apple and put it back? Or have I just sinned against humanity? I'm not entirely sure if I have to hand sanitize between each touch. It's fun. And it's become more exciting. It's more exciting to shop knowing your life is on the line. Remember when you just used to go to the supermarket and wander up and down the aisles and try to decide whether or not you wanted snacks? And now you're like, man, that woman just got within half a trolley length of me. I do not know if I should get these chips or not. Or the opposite. It's hard shopping. They made the shops bigger, too. They're so much bigger. This is my favorite fact about living in Australia. When I moved to Australia in 1992, the average supermarket had around 7,000 items. That number now, in 2020, is over 35,000 items. 35,000 items. And we still expect a kid on minimum wage to tell us where the quinoa is. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know where the quinoa is? It's an ancient grain. I need it to make a salad for my wife, who's home all the time. It's difficult. They put, uh, they put labels at the end of the aisles to give you a hint. That's my favorite part about shopping. It's not the hints, it's about trying to work out how an item got to be the hint item. At the end of every aisle, there's three items listed. You know, I'd say sugar, baking goods, nuts. But then when you look up the aisle, there are clearly more than those three things up there. Why did all those others get left off the list? And how do I associate tomato sauce with nuts? Why are they in the same aisle? <laughs> the weirdest one, there's always an aisle in Australian grocery stores labeled picnic needs. <laughs> because this country loves to go on a picnic. They got a whole aisle dedicated to the needs of the picnic. Now what would you expect to find in a picnic aisle? I'm guessing olives. Do you think olives are in that aisle? No! Do you think there are serviettes and hampers? No! <laughs> Do you know what is inside the picnic aisle? Shiny little hats. <laughs> Shiny little hats. Suggesting that when Australia does go on a picnic, it puts on a production of Chicago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that counts. I wanted to make a musical reference because I'm in the opera house. But... <laughs> But that is a reference to a Broadway musical, which clearly is not an opera. Uh, I would like to make reference to an opera now. But I don't know any operas. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but the first opera to ever play in the Sydney Opera House, just like this, to no one. Because Australians had no idea what opera was. What is it? I have no idea. We should go down to the Opera House, mate. Go down to the Opera House and see what the opera's all about. The only opera I'm familiar with 
is Wagner's ring cycle, and that's because of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> if it weren't for Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd, I would have no idea what Wagner was. To this day, and I am a 52-year-old man, I cannot hear Flight of the Valkyries without quietly singing to myself, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. <laughs> and if you do that all the time, I will tell you one thing, it changes the tone of Apocalypse Now. <laughs> that is a very, very different helicopter scene when they want to kill the wabbit. <laughs> I hate wabbits, by the way, just so you know. I would kill the wabbit. <laughs> I have young daughters. I have young daughters who are twins. They are twin daughters, identical twins, exactly identical, uh, so entirely identical that sometimes I'm not sure if I have twins or if I have one girl that moves very fast. <laughs> and it's awkward to admit that you can't tell your own daughters apart, <laughs> but let's just say it's so bad that I am not allowed to give them medicine. Right. Right. That stems from a little incident when they were six. They both had a little cough. I was sent to give them some cough syrup. About half an hour later, one of them was asleep, and the other one was coughing. I know, weird. You'd think the medicine would affect them exactly the same. It's weird. But I remember, I remember the poor coughing girl, she coughed all night. All night, cough, cough, cough. And then I remember asking the sleeping girl when she woke up two days later, <laughs> what happened? She said, I don't know, Daddy. The unicorns came, and we went for a ride. <laughs> so good. When they were nine, my wife decided they needed a pet. Or as she put it, children need an animal to teach them about love and responsibility. I thought that was weird, because I thought that's what parents did. Pretty sure parents are supposed to teach kids about love and responsibility. But it turns out we've uh, outsourced that to the animal kingdom. <laughs> and she bought a rabbit. That was the part that confused me. She bought a rabbit? I said, there's no way, no way a rabbit is going to be a good pet. She said, the girls are going to love that rabbit so much. And to be fair, the girls loved that rabbit for three days. <laughs> and then I had a rabbit for four years. And that's when I realized how hateful and terrible rabbits are. Rabbits have no love inside them at all. I now hate rabbits so much, I support greyhound racing. No love, nothing but fear and hate. Every day, every day, I would go out to this rabbit's little house, open the lid, and put a plate of his favorite food inside. And every day, he would turn and hide in the corner, run away, as if today was the day I was going to murder him. <laughs> Every single day, run and hide. For like a week, I would understand he's getting used to me. But a year later, that hurts my feelings and doesn't make sense. Like seriously, if a guy came to my house every night and gave me my favorite food, on day seven, I'd give him a key. And if he murders me on day 30, I die happy. I've had my favorite food for a month. Who gets that? Rabbits. Rabbits get that. And they have no appreciation. Every single day for four years. Run and hide. He's going to kill me. Run and hide. Here it comes. Run and hide. I'm going to die. <laughs> Finally, one day, of course, I opened up the lid, and he was dead. I don't know how he died. My theory? Stress. <laughs> Who can live like that? <laughs> Thinking you're going to die every day for four years? <laughs> Tiny little heart, nothing but lettuce? Oh, that's going to hurt. <laughs> but I called my wife, told her what had happened, and she said, oh, the girls are going to be so sad. I said, oh, man, the girls don't even know they've got a rabbit. <laughs> I'll take care of it. So when the girls got home from school that day, I thought I should at least mention it. So casually in passing, I said, girls, you probably don't remember, but we used to have a rabbit. <laughs> and sadly, he passed away this morning. And I couldn't believe the tears. They burst into tears. Oh, Daddy, it's so sad. It's so sad. Can we have a funeral? But see, I'd already made the arrangements. So I had to sit them down and say, girls, you don't know this. But me and Mr. Squiggles were very close. 
And in the last couple of weeks, we knew the time was thin. So I asked him, I said, Mr. Squiggles, what's the one thing you've always wanted to do that you've never done? And you know what he said, girls? He said, I've always wanted to know where that big red wheelie bin goes. <laughs> and that's where he is, girls. Off on his last great adventure. Whenever we hear beep, 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 that'll be the sound of him laughing, having the time of his life. <laughs> All right, just, just for everyone, I want you to know, uh, I tell the story that way because that's how comedy stories work. <laughs> Little funny ending. Uh, what happened in real life was I did throw the rabbit in the bin, and then I told my wife what had happened, and she lost her mind. <laughs> After she had some hard words to me, I had to go back into the bin, get the rabbit out of the bin, wash all the coffee grounds off of it, <laughs> blow dry it like some sort of amateur taxidermist, Girls get home, they get sad. We put Mr. Squiggles in a little shoe box, dig a hole in the backyard, have a little funeral. I think all is well. <laughs> that night at dinner, the girls are still so sad that my wife decides that night she will get them a pet the very next day. <laughs> and the very next day, she went out and bought them a dog. <laughs> now to be fair, a dog is a classic an excellent pet. But thanks to that dog, I have now buried Mr. Squiggles seven more times. <laughs> I'm like a funeral home doing weeklies. <laughs> Just so you know, uh, a lot of people ask when you tell them you have a dog, they want to know what sort of dog you have. Uh, we have what's called a Bordoodle, which is a cross between a Border Collie and a Poodle very much like a cavoodle, or a spoodle, or a labradoodle. The point is, there is not a dog in the world that won't have sex with a poodle. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a dream come true, and before I go, I only have one more thing to say. Charterstone sucks. See ya. <laughs>